What is the Green New Deal, and why should we be worried about it? What's in the news were stories on taser deaths, police brutality, cop suicide, federal cannabis legalization, border protection, and nuclear waste. And a status going to state segment on Panera Cares, as life imitates art. This episode is brought to you by Zencash, now known as Horizon, a cryptocurrency that infuses privacy, anonymity, and security done right. Also brought to you by SmartCash, an easy-to-use, fast, and secure cryptocurrency that supports everyday use for everyday transactions. Welcome to The Lava Flow, channeling the flow of information to the libertarian, anarcho-capitalist, voluntarist, and agorist community. Find us at thelavaflow.com. Here's your host, Roger Paxton. Thank you for joining me this week. From the home state of Anarcho Coffee, where I just ordered some voluntary Valhalla roast coffee and an awesome voluntarist coffee mug at anarchocoffee.com, this is the show that will bring you the people, places, and events that everyone in the Liberty Rebellion needs to know. You can catch me on Twitter at the Lava Flow Pod. This is episode 120, Green New Deal. And it's Tuesday, February 12th, 2018, when there have already been more than 79 people killed by police this year, and the United States debt clock shows us that more than $21,972,300,000,000 in debt. What's wrestling my jimmies this week? You're about to find out. Let's do it to it. As you, my loyal listener, already know, the original New Deal by Roosevelt was a government boondoggle that had huge negative impacts on the United States and the taxpayers and prolonged the Great Depression by years. It also grew the government at a staggering rate. As Howard E. Kirshner said in his book, The Menace of Roosevelt and His Policies, Roosevelt took charge of our government when it was comparatively simple and for the most part confined to the essential functions of government and transformed it into a highly complex, bungling agency for throttling business and bedeviling the private lives of free people. It is no exaggeration to say that he took the government when it was a small racket and made a large racket out of it. Well, the do-gooders are back, and they are trying a new New Deal, and this one is on par to be as disastrous, if not more so, than the last New Deal. This time, they're calling it the Green New Deal. The original idea for a Green New Deal came from the Green Party presidential candidate Jill Stein back in 2012. The Green New Deal is an official part of the Green Party platform, yet it is now being backed by much bigger names from the Democratic Party. Some of the supporters are names that you've heard, including Cory Booker, Kamala Harris, Van Jones, Joseph Kennedy III, Paul Krugman, of course Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, and many more. It's also supported by organizations like the United Nations, Sierra Club, New Economics Foundation, and many others. With names like this behind it, it is easy to make the case that this is not something worth supporting from a libertarian standpoint. However, I wanted to take a deep dive into this topic and find out what it's all about. The supporters of this new potential legislation say that it sets goals for some drastic measures to cut carbon emissions across the economy from electricity generation to transportation to agriculture. In the process, it aims to create jobs and boost the economy. In that vein, the proposal stresses that it aims to meet its ambitious goals while paying special attention to groups like the poor, disabled, and minority communities that might be disproportionately affected by massive economic transitions like those the Green New Deal calls for. Now, I have taken the time to actually read the 14 pages in this proposed legislation, and it is everything you can imagine and even worse. I would bet dollars to donuts that there is something in here that hits every single plank of the Communist Manifesto, all under the guise of saving the planet. Look, this bullshit is not about saving the planet, no matter what they say. It is about power. It is about control. It is about socialism. They just now have another good excuse, just like Roosevelt had with the Great Depression for his New Deal. As Rahm Emanuel said, you never let a serious crisis go to waste. And what I mean by that, it's an opportunity to do things you think you couldn't do before. And that's their mentality, folks, even if they have to completely make up out of whole cloth the serious crisis. 
But what does this bill actually call for? Among the most prominent, the deal calls for meeting 100% of the power demand in the United States through clean, renewable, and zero-emission energy sources. The ultimate goal is to stop using fossil fuels entirely, Ocasio-Cortez's office said, as well as to transition away from nuclear energy. Yeah, because that makes so much sense. Let's move away from the cleanest, cheapest energy source we know about because we're ignorant and scared of the word nuclear. What the actual fuck? In addition, the framework, as described in the legislation, calls for a variety of other lofty goals. Upgrading all existing buildings in the country for energy efficiency. Yeah, because that's going to be cheap. Working with farmers to eliminate pollution and greenhouse gas emissions as much as is technically feasible, while supporting family farms and promoting universal access to healthy food. Boy, those are some buzzwords. Overhauling transportation systems to reduce emissions, including expanding electric car manufacturing, building charging stations everywhere, and expanding high-speed rail to a scale where air travel stops becoming necessary. A guaranteed job with a family-sustaining wage, adequate family and medical leave, paid vacations, and retirement security for every American. And, of course, high-quality health care for all Americans. Which is to say, the Green New Deal framework combines big climate change-related ideas with a wish list of progressive economic proposals that, taken together, would touch nearly every single American and overhaul the economy in a very bad way. Altogether, the Green New Deal is a loose framework. It does not lay out guidance on how to implement these policies. They will kick the can down the road on implementation, of course. Let others worry about how to pay for all of this nonsense. And that brings up a great question. Just how much would it cost, and how would it be paid for? At a time when we are reaching a debt level of $22 trillion right now, and the unfunded liabilities, which includes pensions, Social Security, Medicare, and other mandatory government IOUs, are estimated by some experts at over $200 trillion. The estimated cost of the Green New Deal is anywhere from $2 trillion to $6.6 trillion a year. And I imagine those are conservative, since every government program grows larger after implementation. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez was, of course, unfazed by the cost. Yes, she acknowledged, the Green New Deal would be expensive and require lots of government spending. But, she insisted, there is no need to worry about its long-term effects on the already massive budget deficit, because this initiative would pay for itself through economic growth. In other words, a magic fairy would come and pay for it. The short answer to how will we pay for the Green New Deal is easy. We'll pay for it just as we pay for everything else. Congress will authorize necessary spending, and the Treasury will spend it. This is how we do it. Always has been. Always will be. In other words, they'll just pay for it by printing money and stealing from us. Just like they always do, and just like they always will until we stop giving them the legitimacy that their rule requires. Have you subscribed to The Lava Flow on iTunes or any mobile device yet? Then what's wrong with you? Go to thelavaflow.com slash subscribe so you don't miss a minute of the show. And while you're subscribing, make sure to leave me a five-star rating and review the show to help others find our podcast. Thelavaflow.com slash subscribe. What's in the news? The news you need to know from a libertarian perspective. In Bad Boys news, Reuters has documented a total of at least 1,081 U.S. deaths following the use of police tasers, almost all since the weapons began coming into widespread use in the early 2000s. In 2018, at least 49 people died after being shocked by police with a taser. Reuters contacted 14 police departments, counties, and cities that saw a taser-related or other serious taser-related incident last year. Many police agencies are finally beginning to create policies that will hopefully lower police dependence on these very dangerous tools. One of the nation's largest law enforcement agencies, the Los Angeles County Police, drafted a new taser policy last year that would place new restrictions on the weapons deployment, according to an official familiar with the initiative. 
The updated draft guidelines clarify that the weapon should not be used as a pain compliance tool. Well, no shit and seeks to largely limit its use to cases where a suspect is a danger to others, the officer, or themselves. The Cincinnati Police Department is reviewing its taser policy after an 11-year-old girl was shot in August last year. Police discourse over taser safety has been especially heated in San Francisco, where the Board of Supervisors voted in June to block funding for the police department's long-debated plan to purchase the weapons. The San Francisco Police Department had requested tasers for years, but had been blocked from doing so. Last year, the city's police commission voted to approve their use, but that decision is now in limbo after city supervisors voted to block funding three months later. You know, it's good to see a light being shined on all of these weapons. Yes, they are less than lethal in most cases. And yes, I would much rather a police officer use a taser on somebody than a fucking gun. But these are still weapons that can kill and they should be used very judiciously. The issue, it seems, is that cops have been taught that these things are safe to use for anything, and so they use them way too often. This has got to change, and it seems to be changing in some places. In more Bad Boys news, a federal jury has awarded $250,000 to a Springfield, Massachusetts man who alleged police brutality in a U.S. District Court lawsuit filed against three Springfield police officers and the city of Springfield. Lee Hutchins sued officers Daniel J. McKay, Felix Romero, and Thomas Hervio, alleging the three used excessive force against him in his home on January 20, 2013. Hutchins claimed police pepper sprayed his eyes and beat him with batons while he was trying to defuse a domestic melee. Attorney Luke Ryan, who tried the case with attorneys David Hoos and Samantha LaBeouf, said the jury on Wednesday morning found that Hervio was the only one of the three who used excessive force. Hervio, according to the complaint, unnecessarily thumped Hutchins with a police baton. Ryan said the jury found the other two officers had unlawfully entered Hutchins' home, but were not the proximate cause of the damages. The jury also found that the city of Springfield had a custom of failing to discipline officers, and this custom demonstrated deliberate indifference to the rights of those citizens with whom the officers came into contact, and this was a direct cause of the officer's constitutional violation of Lee Hutchins' rights. City solicitor Edward Picula said the city is reviewing all of its options for post-trial motions and appeals. He also said, We are cognizant of the fact that police put their lives, reputation, and careers on the line every day they go to work, and also cognizant of the fact that the city has implemented a robust disciplinary process and continues to review it to assure we are implementing best practices. We are continuing to cooperate with the Department of Justice in their review, and we expect that we will see continued improvement as we move forward. I am so sick and goddamn tired of this nonsense that cops are putting their lives on the line every single day. Police officers are never in the top 10 dangerous jobs, period. A study last month put officers at number 18. Behind construction workers, grounds maintenance workers, mechanic supervisors, and landscaping supervisors. And none of those other jobs employ people who assault, abuse, and kill people as part of their job while stealing their pay from taxpayers. Zencash has changed their name to Horizon to better represent their transition from a pure cryptocurrency to a pioneering platform that protects consumer data. They're focusing more on the wider vision of what Zencash was all about. The new name, Horizon, reinforces that the project is forward-thinking and visionary and will broaden the horizons of what the community can accomplish in the world using the platform. Not only is it one of the best privacy-oriented cryptocurrencies with zero-knowledge technology built into it, but they also have private chat over their network. And soon, Horizon will include the ability to publish information and go anywhere on the web, all with complete privacy. They are working toward the day when anyone will be able to build privacy-based applications on the Horizon platform and generate income from them. This will allow Horizon to bring thousands of real-life services to the community, services that provide freedom, utility, and privacy. The unique spelling of Horizon is a nod to their heritage and recognizes that they remain committed to the vision that their project was built upon. Their coin and ticker symbol remains Zen. So Zencash is now Horizon, and Horizon is bringing privacy to life. You can learn more at horizon.global. That's H-O-R-I-Z-E-N dot global. 
And even more bad boys news. Chicago police are investigating an officer's death last Saturday as a possible suicide. If so, that would make six police suicides there since the summer. Blue Help, which provides mental health resources for police, said officers are twice as likely to die by their own hands than in a confrontation with a criminal. Twice as likely to die by suicide than in a confrontation with a criminal. This gives even more credence to my previous rant about the dangerousness of being a cop. Nationwide, at least 161 police officers reportedly took their own lives last year and 160 the year before, outpacing the number who died in the line of duty. Five and possibly six in Chicago have died since July. Experts on the subject say stress causes problems at home, relationship issues, and worse. In Chicago, contacts between officers and their families with the CPD's mental health assistance program more than doubled between 2013 and 2017. Now look, you will never hear me call for the death of any human being. I am peaceful by nature, but certainly not a pacifist. I'd rather see officers quit the job and actually be a productive member of society after leaving the force than to have them commit suicide at such a rate. We need to make the job of being a government thug with a badge so undesirable that no one wants to do the job anymore. In cannabis news, Senator Ron Wyden, Democrat from Oregon, introduced legislation that would legalize marijuana at the federal level, designating the measure S-420 in a nod to cannabis culture. The bill, known as the Marijuana Revenue and Regulation Act, would responsibly legalize, tax, and regulate marijuana at the federal level, according to the Democratic side of the Senate Finance Committee, where Wyden is a ranking member. The measure is one of three bills in a broader legislative package, the Path to Marijuana Reform, introduced by Wyden and in the House by Representative Earl Blumenauer, Democrat from Oregon, a member of the Ways and Means Committee. The package aims to preserve the integrity of state marijuana laws and provide a path for responsible federal legalization and regulation of the marijuana industry. The package also includes the Small Business Tax Equity Act, which aims to prevent marijuana businesses from getting hit with an unfair tax bill and another measure that seeks to shrink the gap between federal and state marijuana policies. Blumenauer said, The American people have elected the most pro-cannabis Congress in American history, and significant pieces of legislation are being introduced. The House is doing its work, and with the help of Senator Wyden's leadership in the Senate, we will break through. Now, you guys know that I'm all about harm reduction, and making marijuana legal federally will have a huge impact on harm reduction, period. While I despise the fact that it will come with taxing and regulation at this stage, this will still be a big improvement and will reduce harm overall. So I support this right now. Smart Cash is an easy-to-use, fast, and secure cryptocurrency that supports everyday use for everyday transactions. Smart Cash is focused on getting the currency back into cryptocurrency, and their vision is to replace centralized fiat currencies in day-to-day life. Too many cryptos talk about being used as a currency, but they are all focused on something else and leave user experience for both merchant and customer by the wayside. Smart Cash is focused on being used for business payments and POS through such features like their Instant Pay, which allows for trusted transactions in a second, powered and secured by their 20,000 user run smart nodes. Smart Cash also has a Smart Hive proposal system that is funded by the blockchain, where any user can put forth a project proposal to expand the community, ecosystem, or technology. Holding one smart equals one vote, so all users can participate in voting without having to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to run a full node. The people working on Smart Cash are broken up into six different Smart Hive structuring teams with dedicated team members that are completely funded by the blockchain. There is no CEO, no foundation, no centralized leadership, and there is no need for outside investors to come in and compromise any deals. Check out Smart Cash today at thelavaflow.com slash smart to find out how they are putting the cash into Smart Cash and the currency into cryptocurrency. I believe this is truly a ground floor opportunity to get in on a rising tide. Get a wallet and find an exchange to purchase Smart Cash at thelavaflow.com slash smart. In border protection news, the governor of New Mexico ordered the withdrawal of the majority of the state's National Guard troops from the U.S. border with Mexico 
in a move that challenges President Trump's description of a security crisis. Governor Michelle Luan Grisham announced the partial withdrawal shortly before Trump's State of the Union address. Her Republican predecessor deployed National Guard troops to the border in April 2018 at Trump's suggestion, and 118 remained there before Tuesday's reversal. At the same time, the governor said a small contingent, around a dozen guardsmen, will remain in the southwestern corner of the state, but only to assist with humanitarian needs in a remote corridor for cross-border immigration. She also mobilized state police to assist local law enforcement. New Mexico's contingent of border troops is dwarfed by recent federal deployments of active-duty troops. The Pentagon announced Sunday that it would send 3,750 additional troops to the U.S.-Mexico border to put up barbed wire and provide support for Customs and Border Protection, increasing the total number of troops to 4,350. Now I like the governor's move on this quite a bit. I mean, if we're going to have government police and troops at the border, their mission should be a mission of peace, safety, and humanitarianism. In government boondoggle news, dumpsters of nuclear waste are costing taxpayers a fortune. Under constant armed guard, 16 canisters of highly radioactive waste are entombed in reinforced concrete behind layers of fencing in western Massachusetts. These 13-foot-tall cylinders may not be much to look at, but they are among the most expensive dumpsters in the country, monuments to government in action. Taxpayers have already ponied up $500 million just to secure these 16 dumpsters and are poised to pay $100 million more this time. Nationally, the U.S. government's failure to keep its vow to dispose of spent nuclear fuel and other high-level waste is proving staggeringly expensive. So far, the government has paid out more than $7 billion in damages for violating its legal pledge to begin hauling away nuclear waste by 1998. And costs are expected to soar as more of the nation's aging reactors close permanently. Pilgrim Nuclear Power Station in Plymouth, for instance, is slated to go offline by June. Eventually, the remaining staff may have the sole job of safeguarding the radioactive waste. By the Department of Energy's own optimistic estimates, the government will be forced to cough up a whopping $28 billion more in taxpayer funds in coming years. For more than 60 years, government officials have tried to solve this problem, but plan after plan has collapsed amidst national cries of, not in my backyard. So far, all officials have to show for the work is an enormous $10 billion-plus hole in Nevada that will probably never be used. Now look, I love me some nuclear power. It is by far the cheapest, cleanest way for us to use energy right now, and will probably be that way for the foreseeable future. But the government, being involved in all of this, has turned the promise of cheap, clean fuel into a massive fuck-up, where new plants can't be built, and companies are not allowed to dispose of the waste. Get the government out of the power industry completely. Hell, even Europe is using nuclear energy, and here we are in the Stone Ages. Fuck the Department of Energy in the neck with a spent fuel rod. Exercise your free market muscles by going to thelavaflow.com slash support and giving a per episode donation of as little as a buck an episode. Or use Bitcoin. Get exclusive content, rewards, and help the lava flow become fiscally neutral while providing you more content. Thelavaflow.com slash support. Gonna state. As Karl Marx so famously said in his book, Critique of the Gotha Program, from each according to his ability and to each according to his needs. This was an idea that he proposed in 1875. Now, in Atlas Shrugged, a fiction novel by Ayn Rand, this idea was tested by a company called the 20th Century Motor Company. The original owner of this fictional company died, and his three children proposed a radically new business plan. They would have all the employees work according to their ability and pay them according to their needs. But John Galt stood up and declared that he did not accept that code, and furthermore, he would put an end to that moral code once and for all by stopping the motor of the world. 
In the book, the 20th Century Motor Company began four years of decline as the noble plan pitted the workers against one another and fostered resentment instead of the hoped-for cooperation. Alcoholism and crime became rampant in the company. While all of this was happening, the quality of the company's products deteriorated to unsaleability. After four years, the factory closed. But, as we all know, life tends to imitate art. Or is it the other way around? Either way, we now have a real-life example of something similar to the 20th Century Motor Company. After nine years of being in business, Panera Bread's socialist pay-what-you-want restaurant, Panera Cares, will officially be closing shop on February 15th due to the business model's unsustainability. While Panera Cares built itself as a non-profit restaurant designed to feed low-income people, the business model was anything but. Rather than create a charitable organization that distributes food to needy families, or a discount outlet, or even a $1 menu like every other fast food restaurant, Panera tried to create a socialist system in which meals were offered at a suggested donation price. That means some people would pay more while others would pay less based on what they felt that they could afford. By not simply offering food at a low price, Panera completely removed any incentive for patrons to meet even the lowest standards of consumer retailer exchange. The result? Some people paid their fair share, while others enjoyed a free lunch. And remember, boys and girls, there ain't no such thing as a free lunch. Upon opening the first Panera Cares in 2010, the company founder Ron Sage said the cafe was designed as a quasi-test on human sensibility to raise awareness about food insecurity. Sage said in a TEDx talk, In many ways, this whole experiment is ultimately a test of humanity. Would people pay for it? Would people come in and value it? I guess he found the answer. Panera Cares went on to open five locations in cities like Dearborn, Michigan, Portland, Chicago, Boston, and St. Louis. Not a single one of the restaurants were ever self-sustaining, with some locations reportedly being mobbed by students, along with homeless people looking for a free meal. Eater reports, The Portland-based Panera Cares was reportedly only recouping between 60 and 70 percent of its total costs. The losses were attributed to students who mobbed the restaurant and ate without paying, as well as homeless patrons who visited the restaurant for every single meal of the week. The location eventually had to limit the homeless to a few meals a week. Eater also says, Patrons reported security guards roaming the entrance and glaring at customers. People working with at-risk residents described incidents during which they were rudely told off by managers for abusing the system. Others describe situations in which visitors trying to participate in the pay-as-you-can system feeling shamed for not being able to afford the suggested donation amount. Sage stepped down as the CEO of Panera in 2017. In 2018, he admitted that the nature of the economics did not make sense. I wonder if this jackass is still a socialist. I imagine that he probably is. I mean, there are plenty of socialists around today, even though there has been ample evidence that socialism doesn't work. Evidence means nothing to the mentally insane. Thank you for listening to the show this week. As always, I need to thank my favorite ticket-selling partner, Jessica, for her help with the show. For the show notes to this episode, where I put links and other information that's been on this show, go to thelavaflow.com slash 120. I don't have any new supporters this week, but thanks to all of my awesome supporters, I am at $252.50 per episode, or 50.5% of the way towards my next goal of $500 per episode. Thank you for all of your support, guys, really. Remember, when I hit this next goal, I will be upping the content I bring you from half an hour per week to a full hour. I know you want more content from me, and I want to give it to you, so add your pledge today to help me bring you twice the lava flow that you're getting today. So exercise your free market muscles by going to thelavaflow.com slash support and giving a per-episode donation of as little as a buck an episode, using Federal Reserve Notes through Patreon or monthly using Subscribestar or using cryptocurrencies through Bitbacker. I want to be able to bring you more content soon, so make sure to add your donation today to help make that happen. I have a new Apple podcast review this week. Jax1 said... Glad I found it. I am a daily listener of the Survival Podcast. Jack was on someone else's podcast, and after looking around, it led me here. I am glad I found this podcast. MT Brand, Liberty, Texas. Thanks, Jax. 
Jack Spirko is a good friend of mine, and I'm glad that you listen to his stuff. I started listening to him way back when he was doing his episodes from his car doing his commute to work. Thanks so much for the review. And if you have a minute and you want to hear your review read right here on the show, please go to thelavaflow.com slash apple and leave me a rating and a review. All the cool kids are doing it. Thank you to everyone who's left me a rating and a review so far. You guys rock. To all of you who haven't, can you guys help me out and go leave a review for me? Go to thelavaflow.com slash apple to do that now. Until next time, keep striking the root. Thank you for listening to The Lava Flow at thelavaflow.com. Don't miss an episode. Subscribe now at thelavaflow.com forward slash subscribe. This has been a Pax Libertas Productions podcast.